special guest, uh, Seven um, Bomar, and we're talking about something that no one really talks about, um, uh, the situation of souls and uh, out-of-body experiences and things. And one thing I want to ask you, too, um, there was a question, that I know my co-host wants to ask you some things, but I want to get to one other point real quick and bring him on. But um, if, when a person dies or has an out-of-body experience, is there a difference in the weight of the body itself when the uh, spirit leaves the body? Oh, for sure. I mean, some some can actually lose their life by leaving the body. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of in this. You know, when you really study deeper levels of spirituality, especially going to the east, there was um, you know a lot of deeper writings about you can't generally leave your body without having a spirit that is so large that you can afford to keep some spirit in your body because when the spirit leaves the body, it gets cold and it doesn't have, you know, it's missing basically, it's, it's emanation. And so, yes, you can be very affected by leaving the body. There are different things that can happen, but generally everyone has a, as an oversoul. I mean, not generally, everyone has an oversoul. So that's really oversoul kind of uh, business, for lack of terms, meaning the oversoul are handling, you know, when a person's getting out of the body and what happens to their body and that kind of thing. But you become more aware of that uh, early as you begin meditation, as you begin using the breath as power, uh, as, a, as an actual boost to the uh, way to uh, boost the system and to put uh, fuel into the blood. Now, how about the ancient Egyptians? They believed that um, in the afterlife, once they had passed on, that their um, soul or entity would end up somewhere else in another body, and then if they ever came to um, the, where they were buried in Egypt and recognized themselves, then they would receive the uh, wealth of that pharaoh uh, or, pharaoh, uh, or the queen. Um, what is your opinion of that theory? Well, I think the recognizing of yourself is something that happens internally, and I think that the wealth of the queen is obviously knowledge. So I think that the symbolism of the Kemetan, uh well, I guess let's use the correct term, Egypt, that term as Egypt, was a place of slavery. So in that tense, then anyone entering that place was going through hardships and troubles. And through those hardships and tr troubles, there may be a metamorphosis that takes place, just as many young gentlemen today do go to prison, and then they come out, and then they, they change their life, and they emancipate themselves. That's, I'm one of them. So... Yeah, in that sense, I would say it, it, it's very correct. But when you're talking about the chemists, the chemists were on something totally different. It's, it's about laying down foundations and then going other places and laying down foundations. It's about total survival of the genetic species and, and the vast level of the species because it's not just humans. It's not just uh, uh, crocodiles. It's not just ser serpents. It's not just uh, uh, baboons and elephants. There's a lot of different other organisms that are here as you begin to witness the nobles, meaning the, the gases. The, uh, the, the, the metals, osmium, ruthenium, these are different elements that you can't see with the physical eye, right? So anyone that was very spiritual could see these elements. Now people need telescopes and things to see them, but the ancients had already isolated these elements from the other side, <laughs> meaning that we're trying to discover them. They weren't in the level of, of, of discovery. They knew everything. There's only one thing to know, and that's just all itself. And then everything collapses upon itself, and you become an omniscient. This is what is attempted to be achieved by every uh, bodhisattva or every Eve angel, every great uh, being that comes into full awakening first takes the vow, and the vow is to, uh, to help ascend all species. Because from that point, you know that if you take that vow, that eventually you will get yourself completely whole again. Because after the Big Bang, that's division, that's fractalization, that's five, that's fighting, that's fire. That's conflict. All these words are synonymous, and it wears us down. So we get tired. We get sleepy. We divide. We die. So these words only mean to keep splitting. This is mitosis. We have children. Our children are weaker than us because we're not strengthening their DNA or their ladder or their spine so that they can stand erect. So there's a, there's a riddle also here, meaning that there is a way with the words. The words do mean something. First of all, with English, the words are backwards. So this automatically changes the direction of anyone's mind who's thinking in it. And notice we think in the language versus 
um, we have to consider that then as software. Because if I say in my mind, let me go to the store in English, I'm loading that into the Holy of Holies. So that's why the ancients, they thought in the tone and vibration of what they wanted to do, and this allowed them to be very successful. This, what we're in now is a microcosmic version, and I wanted to clear out, I wanted to clear out some things here because it's very important for everyone. I feel like what I need to deliver tonight is this ancient issue going on between man and woman, a.k.a. five and six, who constantly oscillate meaning that man constantly becomes woman, woman constantly becomes man. If we didn't notice, a person has a masculine or a positive and a negative inside of every body. But the interesting thing here is, is that it is the source of one of the greatest levels of the conflict, which is basically what came first, the chicken or the egg. Because woman does believe that she is the generator in this planetary system, and that man is basically here because of she's allowing him to be. While everything shows you that man has a female semen that comes out and goes into the egg, and the semen is what determines whether it's a female. So there's a metaphor here in the beginning of this crazy book about uh, Eve being removed from Adam. That's not what it says in Hebrew. What it says is, is that Hawa was removed from Cadman, meaning that Cadman is an androgynous. It's a male-female. It's self-generating, called parthenogenic. Okay? And then what, when you split that, meaning you put the male on one side and you split the male from the female, and then now you have them two out in 3D, they will go into conflict with each other, but that is because that's why man becomes then man. He doesn't become CAD man. Now, the word CAD means a design or a creation or a creator. So what a CAD is is a womb. Right? They even play around with it today. They, oh, let's go into AutoCAD. What do you do in AutoCAD? You create. It is a womb inside of there, but it's digital. So the CAD being removed from man makes man just opposed to woman. So this is basically five versus six. So fi fire versus sex. You know, they're so close together, these two translations, right? And so this is the dualistic uh, um, taking place that happens on these kind of dimensions that makes it God's or God's chariot 